So it's good to see you all. It's 7:30. I we'll just go ahead and get started, and folks can join us as they as they get ready. But it's um uh, it's a beautiful day in Chicago. That's the good news. Um, and I I don't know if you've heard this, but a polar vortex is about to descend on the uh, the northeast. They're about to gut, uh, they're expecting snow and freezing temperatures in Maine and Massachusetts and Vermont and all of that. And, and it's supposed to get all the way below freezing as far south as where my mother lives in Alabama. We're on for the, oddly enough, Chicago's on the outer skirts of it. So we'll just dip into the forties tomorrow, but uh, evidently it's going to be really brutal on the East coast. So I'm kind of happy to be where I am today. I'm good. I'm happy. I'm okay with it. <laughs> so anyway, it's good to see you. And we've got a great lesson tonight. And it's just, um, I look forward to this every week. This is sort of, Thursday night has become the best night of the week for me. So uh, I just am really excited to see you all. And um, we're going to get started. And then uh, we'll, there, we've got lots to talk about tonight. So why don't we just have a quick word of prayer. I've got a couple announcements, uh, some really exciting things to talk about. And then uh, we'll get right into the lesson. How's that? Are we all good? Oh, I just got the door closed on me. Evidently, I'm talking too loudly for the work that's going on <laughs> in the other room. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for those that have made the time and made the effort to be here. God, we thank you for those that will come later who can't be here with us right now, but will come later and look at this. We thank you for those that would like to be here, but have other conflicts. Most of all, God, I pray that you will be with us whatever time we look at this, whenever we look at it, that you will speak to our hearts, you will open our understanding, you will move in our spirits, be real to us tonight in this study, and we will give you thanks for all that you do, because this is the will of God concerning us, is that we give thanks, and so we say yes to your will, to your way, and to your word tonight. We ask all of this in the name of your beloved, amen. 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 There's Dana. Hey, Dane. Hi, Dana. Oh, Hi, Chris. Jen. Chris is, is coming in. Tim Healy's coming in. This is wonderful. So a couple quick announcements. Sunday mornings at Pilgrim are just as good and fine as ever. And I was uh, in the office this week and was congratulating Delina on the wonderful production value that's coming into play in the Pilgrim services. They're just looking sharp. And so I'm about to step on my stuff here. And so they're just looking very sharp and I think it's very exciting. So uh, if you're looking for morning worship, Sundays at Pilgrim is a, is a wonderful place to be. Amen from all the Pilgrimites, amen. amen. <laughs> Speaking of which though, we are coming up on our first anniversary of having Sunday services. And we started Gather on Pentecost Sunday last year. And I was talking to um, Russell and Angela this week about some different music stuff and everything. And, and I said, we've got to go back to having a Sunday afternoon worship experience of some kind, um, even before we get ourselves into a, a, you know, a place where we're together uh, physically. And so we are going to start laying claim to the last Sunday of the month while we are still in COVID time. And so Sunday, May 31st, will be our first online service. It's going to be a very kind of unique experience. We're not going to try to replicate what we do in the room uh, for Gather when we're together for worship. We're going to do some of that. But there are several things that we want to do and want to think about. And so I'm um, wanting to give a little bit of a plug here for some of this. But um, and we looked at the first, at May 31st, and it's like, well, Eureka, it's Pentecost Sunday. So we get to sort of do a an anniversary too at the same time so it's it's a it's a cool thing but what we do want to do is we want to uh do a virtual choir and russell and angela will be working with that if you are interested at all in singing in the virtual choir you know choirs are made for people that aren't great singers amen wilbert which is for people that love to sing and so uh if you are interested in singing what we're going to do is put together an arrangement of a song Russell is going to put a, a music track together. And if you're interested, either, uh, you know, text, uh, let me know, or you can put it in the chat here um, and, uh, and let, let us know that you're interested. I don't get to watch the chat while I'm teaching. I'm trying to teach run slides and I can't watch the chat all at the same time. So if I don't respond in, 
the chat, please be patient with me. But if you'd like to sing in the virtual choir, let me know. And what we're, we'll do is we'll send you the track and instructions on how to record and some music. We got a little sheet music so you can follow along and how to record your part of it. And, it, and we'll open, we're gonna have a virtual choir. And then we're going to also do an interesting, I was thinking about how do we do communion. And what I would want us to all do in the next two or three weeks, anytime during the next couple of weeks, is to do a communion with yourself at home and just shoot that on your, on your phone. Just with, you know, if you've got somebody else in the house that you can share communion with, share with them, but just shoot, just giving one another bread or eating bread and taking the cup and shoot that video. And then you'll also send that back to me. I'll, I'll get all of this out to you. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll put all that together so we can see one another take communion. I've been watching all the different ways folks have tried to do communion online and it's very interesting. Uh, the challenge that I think I have with some of it is that um, you don't get to see each other do it. You know what I'm saying? It's part of the communion is the community of it. And so we will, we will do that. So I'm going to put all that information together and, uh, and we'll have some video input from you all. I, I'll bring a message and uh, we'll have some special music that we'll also do. Above all else, this is an opportunity for you to invite some friends. And folks that you've been telling about gather, this is their chance to get in painless and get a sense of what we're like in terms of a, a worship experience. Is this exciting to you all? I'm excited about it, but uh, does this sound exciting to you all or not? Yeah. Yes. No. Anything oh, you do is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Good. Yay. Good. All right. I'm, I, I'm excited. I think it'll be, it can be very, very cool. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the big announcements that we've got here is, um, is that now, why isn't this coming up? Let's see. Oh, the other final thing is I want to thank those who came by the Mary Don't You Weep conversation with the Lighthouse Foundation on Saturday. That was a really wonderful and lively conversation. And we met the, uh, the care team, the strategy board met again last Tuesday. And so we're going to have a follow-up conversation to that. One of the things that we spent some time talking about in the last conversation was how what we are all learning as a result of COVID can help reshape our understanding and our empathy with people that are on the margins. And so we've got some more conversation we want to have around that. And that will be on June 6th from 12 to 2. Uh, this information will be posted on the Gather uh, Facebook page as well. So if you'd like to join, uh, that would be wonderful to see you all there. Oh, see, every time I do that, I see what happens. Okay. Um, now, let's do a quick check-in. Tonight, we're gonna do a really, we're gonna do a rapid fire check-in. And, and since our theme tonight is Thanksgiving, what we're going to do is I'm just gonna open it up and I just want to know one thing you're thankful for in one word, just one word, no explanations. Just, we're gonna do a shout out. So just one word, then take what, take, Five seconds to think and then start saying what you're thankful for. Chocolate. Chocolate, amen. Chef. My parents. Life. 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 Puppies. Puppies. Cats, yes. Parents. I'm here. Green. Green. Green this. space. It was, all, it was everyone. See, Being here with everyone. Being, okay, togetherness, yeah. So much, so, so much to be thankful for. And that's kind of where we're moving to talk about how Thanksgiving works in the Psalms. And so I'm kind of gonna bring us up to speed with this lesson by going back first of all, and kind of talking about what we've covered so far. Um, I've had some really good conversations uh, with folks in the last week, I've seen folks, and what's really funny is coming out of um, coming out of um, of last week's lesson. What was very interesting uh, was how many people have said to me, "Okay, Pastor Tim, I've been in lament, but I'm working toward praise." I, I, I think I heard that about from five different people that were in last week's lesson. I'm really working on my praise. And so if we think about just what we've talked so far about the way the Psalms work, they were, they began with lament. We started talking about lament and how lament really explains sort of our, 
it, it, it is what conveys or describes or what sort of talks about our disorientation, right? We're thrown off. We all understand that right about now. Are you still a little disoriented? <laughs> Are you still having those moments where you just go like, wait a minute, hang on a second, just hold on, I gotta do what now? Now what do I have to do? Uh, the news is becoming increasingly disoriented as more and more states go on and offline and we don't know who's doing what and we don't know where the problem is and what the problem is and who's in charge and who's not in charge. So when you're feeling off balance and disordered and disoriented, lament is how you give expression to that. And one way to think about lament is us sort of dealing with our usness. These are our challenges. These are our ways of trying to understand what we're doing and how all of this is working. And then what we talked about last week, we talked about the Psalms of praise and how they sort of do a reorientation. They kind of restabilize us by talking about who God is, God's attributes, God's godness, so that there is a way of kind of finding and reor reorienting ourselves in a new kind of stability, a new sense of order. There is this idea that if I don't, if I can't control this, it doesn't mean that the situation's out of control. You ever thought about that? If a lot, I know a lot of folks that want to control the whole situation all the time, and when they lose control, they think the situation is out of control. But that doesn't happen, because if God is there, God is in control. Amen? Amen. And so there is this sense that we, we, so we go from lament and we go into praise, into proclaiming God's godness. And that leads us to tonight, which is we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, which I kind of talk about as being praise plus, right? And that's when our usness, our lament, kind of runs into and get intersects with God's godness or praise. Something happens. A story happens is what happens because we are somehow or another transformed. We get through what we're going through whenever we change our position from fear to trust, from worry to 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 being more settled or more relaxed, the story changes one way or another whenever we move. Now, a lot of us, because a lot of us are control freaks, that I'm going to raise my hand on that. You know, I, I, I'm one of those people that think if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. But part of Thanksgiving reminds us and gets us into um, a mode of storytelling that also serves to remind us that there is more at work in our situation than just us. And that's very hard for a lot of us to accept because a lot of us have been taught to be independent and self-sufficient, you know, and to be care of it, it doesn't get taken care of. And yet, we, all, we have repeatedly in our lives marveled how things have worked out. Has anybody experienced that? How I had no idea what was going, how it was gonna work, and somehow or another, Something happened I didn't see coming, and it worked out. And that's, uh, I will, I'll tell you that right now. In our house right now, my own business uh, uh, is sort of kind of up and down. We've got clients who can't figure out what they want to do. And so I've got a job that's really hot and going 90 to nothing, and then all of a sudden you get the call, we're going to put the brakes on this for a while until we refigure this out because we don't know how long we're gonna be out, blah, blah, blah. Hey, they just don't pay me to hang around in case. And so I wanted to be the big worry wart and start thinking about what do I need to do? I need to probably start calling some people and drum up some work and out of nowhere, Walt got brought on to this consulting firm in diversity and inclusion and he can't stop working. I would just like to see him and say hello to him every now and then because he is, <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, he's up. And when I go to bed, he's working. And it's all, our needs are being cared for. And he didn't go looking for this job. They came looking for him because they had seen him facilitate a group at the, um, the, gay, the Gay Men's Health Caucus in Chicago. And they were impressed with that and said, you look like somebody that could do this kind of work. Would you be interested? And so how does that work? That's the story. And that's the Thanksgiving. You see the way that that works out. God moves in and does something that we can't explain that we didn't see coming. But part of that 
gaining the finding the ability to recognize and see that comes whenever we let go of some of our usness. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You let go of some of our usness so we can let God do some of God's godness, right? That's the challenge. And then a story emerges. And so the Thanksgiving Tim, Psalms. Are, Tim. Yeah. Hey, yes. Tim, can I tell you something? Yep. You, you go, every, twice so far, you've gone away and frozen. And when you come back, you're not in the same place. You're like a sentence or two ahead. Okay. You're I'm frozen. Just, I, my, the challenge that we've got tonight is that I've got an unstable internet connection and I can't fix that. I've tried. We've been. Can I've you been on see track. yourself? I see myself and I'm going, yeah, I see myself and I'm going fine. I'm doing fine. And it's fine. It's actually fine for me, Tim. So it, it, it could be, I mean, I, you haven't broken up that much for me. So I, it may I'm be having breakup issues too. So it just may just be kind of random how it's coming through. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, just one second. But I know I appreciate that. So we'll so we'll just we'll rough it. Is that okay? Can we? Okay. <laughs> um, but so that's kind of the the idea that's at work for us is this idea of um, of knowing that our stories come from where we are and where God is coming together. And that's where we, we, we talk all the time about faithful witness and about what your testimony is. That's really all witness and testimony is, is this is where I was, this is what God did, and I'm thankful. Did, was I alive for that part? Did you all get that? <laughs> this is what God did. I mean, this is where I was. This is what God did, and now I'm thankful because I didn't see what was, what was really working and what was really going on. So, what's interesting about the Thanksgiving Psalms is that these are the, these are the Psalms, these are the songs of the people of Israel. And there are tremendous, particularly in the Thanksgiving uh, psalms, there are what you might think of as Exodus echoes. In um, ancient is Israelite faith, the Exodus was everything. This is before the prophets, before the temple, way back in the, the mid-Bronze Age. Everything was about the deliverance. The story of the people was about the deliverance out of Exodus. And there was an arc to that story. And the Thanksgiving Psalms take their clues from the Exodus. And so they follow the same kind of pattern, the same contours, or the same kind of arc. And the way that that goes is it's, you could think of it as sort of in three movements. There is the cry, there is the hearing, and then there is the thanksgiving. The people, and this is the, gla the classic example, the Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. There's the cry. Now here comes the hearing. God heard their groaning. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. That's in Exodus 2. And then what happens, we all know the story, maybe like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I turned on Turner Classic Movies and that Charlton Heston, Ten Commandments. I can never say no to that movie. I don't know why. It's a, a, it's a crazy movie, but I still, I can't, you know, I don't know where these characters came from and who invented all of this lust and, and intrigue. But anyway, there it all is. And I'm watching it in the, we all know the big moment when they walk through the Red Sea and on the other side of their deliverance, Miriam grabs a tambourine and there's this rejoicing and Miriam sang to them, it says in Exodus 15, sing to the Lord for God has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, God has thrown into the sea. So here is your Thanksgiving that happens. And that's sort of the formula for Thanksgiving. We would think of it this way in the context of our conversations. The cry is us. The hearing is God. The Thanksgiving is our story. So when you're reading Psalms of Thanksgiving, and when it says, "Thank, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, you get, expect that kind of movement in those psalms to go from 
I was in trouble. I can't, they, the psalmists, and we're going to say this a number of times, the psalmists use a lot of really melodramatic language. Have you noticed that? If, you're, if you've been reading the psalms during this study more closely, every, every fourth or fifth psalm, the psalmist is in some kind of pit. Have you noticed the pit is very popular in the psalms? He lifted me out of a terrible pit. I was in, it's the, you know, Brotherman says they're just in the pits. It's just the pits with these guys, you know? But they're always in a pit. They're either in a pit or else they're drowning. The waters were washing over me. I was not able to, I thought I was going to drown, but then you saved me. There are all of these, the Thanksgiving Psalms are very melodramatic. Does not mean that these poets all experienced, had a pit experience. Jeremiah does, but that's after the Psalms are written. They have a pit experience. It doesn't mean that they were literally thrown in a pit. It's highly unlikely that any of them were in any amount of water they could drown in, because outside of Galilee, there's not a lot of water around that you can go fall in the Dead Sea, maybe, you know, but not a lot of water to be drowning in. So to be in a desert country, to be talking about this water overflowing me, what they're trying to get us to is the same when we say we're overwhelmed or whatever, we're depressed. They're using these wonderful metaphors to get us to what the emotional life is and what they're contending with emotionally, right? So this is sort of the, 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 the contour of the way that these praises go, uh, these thanksgiving. Us, our lament, and a lot of times the laments get reviewed, and then there is God, and what God does, God hears, and God is moved, and God acts, and that leads to the story. In a lot of ways, a lot of people refer to these, they talk about... Um, crisis and rescue that a lot of the psalms are built on this this premise of crisis and rescue we were in a terrible situation and then god comes to the rescue and so that's sort of the, the idea that's that's in place there so then you have two different kinds and we're going to get to really good stuff here in a minute but i want to kind of give you a little background there are two kinds of um of um Thanksgivings. And the first one that we want to talk about is the in individual Thanksgiving song. And it's always a narrative account of God's deed. It's crisis and rescue. Crisis is often pain. I just want to just realize I just taught you this slide. I didn't realize I've done that. <laughs> crisis comes in terms of a life and death situation. Nobody ever, no, there are no Psalms that say, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for God is good. I lost my car keys. Okay. They're never like that. Oh, give thanks unto the, the dog ate my homework. They're not that like, that's not where they are. They are always life and death kinds of things. And the rescue is often painted as liberation from death. You hear, God lifted me out of hell. I was in hell. And God lifted me out of hell, out of shill. God, and the lament that is often recalled so that it's like this Thanksgiving is almost like a sequel in many ways to many of the laments and some and then i want to give thanks because god has answered and all of this language is all hyperbolic it's not meant to be taken literally which is a problem for folks that want to lead, read scripture literally it's like well you got to do something with the book of psalms because these people were clearly not overwhelmed and and, and drowning they were talking about their emotions right so that's a that's uh that's the way that that goes. So if we, we look at one of these, let me see. Um, how about uh, Bill or Jane, one of you, can you take the first column of Psalm 30 and read that if you can see it? And then Karen, since you just had a seat, if you could read the back, the, 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 the second half of it, that would be wonderful. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. That was really uh, predestined. I was just reading Psalm 30, and the reason oh. I was reading Psalm 30, it was because uh, our hero and, 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 and mentor Owen Lovejoy had written oh, yeah. a, 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 a article on this when he was a young man. Now, Owen Lovejoy <laughs> was unintimidated and said that Lincoln was unterrified and unseduced by ambition. And mm -hmm. you got to know that Owen Lovejoy, um, this, the second line of this is Owen Lovejoy all over. So I, <laughs> the Lord does provide. 
Anyhow, here we go. Uh, mm -hmm. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. Uh, that line, re remember yes. it. And did not let my foes rejoice over me. Oh, yes. Lord, my God, I cry to you for help. And you have healed me. Oh, Lord, you brought me, my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh, you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my posterity, I shall never be moved. Does it go on? Uh, and then Karen, do you want to pick up his seven, please? Sure. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So to see the movements we've been talking about there. Before we go on, I have to give uh, Bill a minute to plug his website. Bill, I've been looking at your website uh, with Owen Lovejoy and Abraham Lincoln. He's doing some wonderful work. We're doing some historic retrieval of justice in, in great American stuff. What? Give us the, the name of it. It's, uh, what is it called again? Oh, there they are. Look at them. He's doing some really wonderful That's writing. A, this is done by Greg Phillips. This is a painting of Abraham Lincoln and Owen Lovejoy reading the Psalms to each other in 1862 huh. in the midst of the crisis, especially after Willie, uh, the, the Lincoln's son, Willie, had died. They were very distraught. And, and, and Pastor Lovejoy had lost a, a, a child early, but, but they were, became much closer friends. The website is called increaseresect.com. But yes. and thank you for the plug. But I want uh, uh, the, we have a number of copies of this picture for those of you in, in, that are interested. And in. we have just written a, an article about uh, the Psalms that were favorites to both uh, uh, Lovejoy <laughs> and, and Lincoln. And we'll be posting that soon. Thank you for the plug. Oh no! It's a really it's a fascinating it's a fascinating uh, website. I've been kind of just enjoying it. So when you brought in Owen Lovejoy, my my heart lit up just a little bit. Thank you. Uh, let's talk now about what's going on here. Thank you. What can we say about this person who's written this song? What what can we discern? What is this person going through? Thank you. <laughs> Any thoughts? He's been taunted by, Robert, been you look taunted like you by his enemies. He's in the pit. It's really sad. He's in the pit. He's is, in the pit. He's been taunted Sheol? by his enemies, right? He's in the pit. Sheol is the the is, is the, the word for Sheol? the Jewish afterlife. It's not a lot of times. So yeah, it does not get it does not get translated as it, I think it's translated as hell. But in ancient Jewish thought, Sheol is actually the place of the dead. It's a place of just sort of absence of life in general. And so what it, this the psalmist is saying is like I have been I've been the life has gone completely out of me. Right? You restored me to life. You know, even though I was among people who were just just as good as dead, I might as well have been dead. But if you look. The sort of the rationale when the usness of this writer encounters the the nature of God, but your favor, oh God, you established me. You know all of this. He, you're, you know God's favor, God's anger may be for a moment, but it's favors for a lifetime. He comes in, he gets this wonderful realization, which is 
you know, what profit is there if I'm just as good as them? What profit is there in me just being depressed and pushed down? And so there is this sort of reckoning that happens in the middle of this Thanksgiving. And then it's like, God, you turned my morning into, you know, you take, took my, 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 my morning into dancing. You took my sorrow, my sackcloth, and you clothed me with joy. So I will give thanks to you, how long? Forever. So this is almost what we're here, what we're really reading about is, has the Genesis in a lament of just great spiritual and existential kind of crisis, right? Where am I? What am I doing? Who, I don't even know if I feel alive. I don't know what this is supposed to be getting. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then it's like, but wait, that's not how God is. That's me. Who is God? God is loving. God favors, right? You know? And so your favor, O oh Lord, you established me. Even though it felt like you hid your face and I was lost, I was dismayed, I cried, and I figured out, you're not going to get any glory. There is no praise for you in this kind of, in this kind of setting. So there is this, this, the Thanksgiving prayer is in itself a story, a movement of someone who at, a, at some point was lost in some way or other. Are you all tracking? Yes? Amen. Let's look at, let's look yes. and see what. Amen. Amen. What happens in a communal Thanksgiving, it's, but it, it moves into more like a hymn. And that's what's really wonderful. When we sing hymns in church, classically for it to be a hymn, it is a Thanksgiving that we would sing. And these psalms are much more spacious and general, so they can include more people. These are not specific stories. They're sort of like prompts for you to sort of fill in the blanks with your own story. They usually begin with an exhortation to be thankful. And sometimes they have specific examples of reasons to be thankful. And sometimes they're just like, be thankful for God is good. But the big celebration there is that there is divine love and reliability is in this, is, is in this text. There's something magnificent that's happening here. And what the, the, the community is celebrating is God's love and God's faithfulness or reliability. And that's the thing. God will come through. Again, the language is not meant to be taken literally, but the language is also very poetic and high flown. Many of us know this psalm, right? Um, see, Dana, you want to give, a crack, give us a crack of Psalm 100 here? Is she there? She seems frozen. Okay, I'll take it. Boy, we're having internet problems tonight. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, right all the okay. earth. Serve no, the I'll Lord with it. celebration. No, I got before it. God with shouts of love. Are you there? Okay. All right, good. Take it. Can you hear me? Okay. I'll yes, yes. shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with celebration. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us. We belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his own pasture. Enter his gates with thanks. Enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him. Bless his name. Because the Lord is good, his loyal, love, his loyal love lasts forever. His faithfulness lasts generation after generation. She reads well. She reads well. So the only specific oh, image that we have in here is God as the shepherd and us as the flock, right? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> There is this idea of God being the shepherd, and that's another common trope in the Psalms, usually in communal Psalms. Whenever folks are together, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is our shepherd. Psalm 95 says, let's sing unto the Lord, let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation, for we are his, the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand, it says. And so this idea of God as a shepherd for the congregation, that means a whole lot to them. 
Why? Because they are fully reliant as a people, as a community. They are essentially in their thanksgiving, they're also confessing, we depend on God for our guidance. If it's not, for, if God isn't guiding us, then we just don't know what, what we would do. So that's sort of Psalm 100 begins to work in that way. And all of the Thanksgiving Psalms, they sort of vacillate or they fluctuate between what writers call the agony and the ecstasy, right? There is, in the communal uh, hymn, there is the protest of the petition, the agony, the lament. Oh, God, our, you know, our struggles, be with us, O oh Lord, the, our foes are upon us. And the celebration side, when it's time to give thanks, erupts in a hymn. On the personal side, there is the individual lament. We've, been, we've read quite a few of those and been looking at those, and that erupts in a song. This is my song. So my favorite hymn of all time is Blessed Assurance. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That will just make me cry sometimes. I could just sit by myself and sing that and cry to myself, which is sort of doesn't look like ecstasy, but it kind of is. <laughs> but, in, but, in the, but in all of it, it is this idea that I've been through something and now I can praise and I can give thanks to God. And so the, the lesson in the thanksgiving and the idea of us telling the story is that telling God our unholy truth enables us to eventually revel in God's holy, attentive generosity. Because when we come to God and say, I, I just don't have the strength, I don't have the wisdom, I don't have the patience, I don't have the will, I don't have the wherewithal, I don't have the good spirit, whatever I don't have that's truthful about me, that's caught, I don't have the knowledge. Eventually in our laments, we get to why I don't have the stamina, I can't take it anymore. Eventually, the, and then we move into a praise, our, the story that grows out of it, the thanksgiving that grows out of it is, and somehow or another, I found it. Somehow or another, you brought that to me. You came, you delivered me, you brought me out, you supplied my need. The old saints in the Pentecostal church just used to call it testimony. I've got a testimony. And that's what it was. And you could stop them. You could stop them dead. You could see them in the store. You could see them in jewel and say, what's your testimony? And they say, oh, child, you got five minutes. Let me tell you something. Boom. Let me just tell you what happened this week. And they were always, I go back to Gloria's comment last week about some of the people that were in the most distressed situations always having a praise. And there is something powerful in folks, if you've known folks that are in duress who somehow or another know how to get to praise, they know that they can change the way the story ends so that they are not stuck in lament. They are moving toward, I don't know, I just had to say, God, you got this. And my story changed. There are several of us on the, line, on the line who are in recovery. And we know how the, God, the godness angle of God meeting us comes into play in a lot of the 12 step programs and recovery programs, where I had to realize there was something bigger than me that was in control. And that changed my story. And so that's kind of what the, these Thanksgiving Psalms want to do. I asked you all to take a look at Psalm 107, and I'm going to kind of move through this rather quickly because there's a video that I want to show you before we end and, um, and a few other things that I, I really want us to, to kind of talk about. But Psalm 107 is a great example of a Thanksgiving hymn because it's almost, it almost reads like a movie. It starts with this prelude, right? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you come out of certain church environments, you've heard that before. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. For those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. And it's almost like the songwriter looks up and says, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I want to tell you a few stories. Let me just tell you a few stories. Fasten your seatbelts. And then we get a series of stanzas in this that are really quite wonderful. If you've read the Psalm, you'll know what we're talking about. The first stanza and the first chorus, I'm not gonna read the whole Psalm because it goes on forever, but about people that were lost in the desert. They, couldn't, they had no food, they had no water, they didn't know how they were gonna survive. They cried to the Lord. They were nowhere near an inhabited town, the text says. And God led them 
to a town. And then you get the chorus. Let them thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God, God's wonderful works to humankind, for God satisfies the thirsty and the hungry God fills with good things. That let them thank the Lord becomes the cadence of this psalm. If you've not read it, you ought to spend some time with it because it's beautiful. So you get that and it's like, well, okay, that's a story. I have a hard time reading these few verses and I'm not thinking about Lawrence of Arabia. I must be in an old movie night kind of man, mind, mindset right now. But it feels like, oh, you know that scene where Lawrence got lost in the wilderness and all of a sudden he comes out of the desert and his face is all sand swept in it? You know, it's like, yeah, that's kind of what they're talking about here. And then you get to the second stanza and these folks are imprisoned in a labor camp. They're working and they're enslaved and they cry to the Lord and the text says that God liberated them and broke their chains. And the next thing you have is the stand, uh, the chorus comes back in and what is it? The same drumbeat. Let them thank the Lord for God's steadfast love for his wonderful works to humankind. For why? Now the reason is different. God shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. So these folks that were enslaved for whatever reason, and remember, none of this is what? Literal. This is all, there. this is people talking about, in many ways, kind of psychological states. This really comes into play in the third stanza, where it talks about that they were very, very sick. They were so sick and so downhearted, they didn't want to eat. They don't even eat. They're that depressed. And they cried to the Lord, and it says God sent God's word and healed them. And here comes the chorus. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. I love that what the poet's doing here is very interesting. He says they're so depressed they don't even have an appetite. So what do they do? What is the counsel for them to do? To offer thanksgiving sacrifices, to give food to God. It's kind of an interesting idea there. But the poet is doing some really wonderful things. Then we go to the next stanza. These are storm-tossed seafarers, and they, they're in fear for their lives. They go out to the sea in ships, it says, and they cry to the Lord, and God calms the sea for them. And then, again, here it comes. Let them thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works. Let them extol God in the congregation and praise God in the assembly of the elders. Now, this is kind of remarkable, this little tag, because it presumes they made it back alive, right? And what does it want them to do? Don't come back alive and hold a press conference. Go to church. Tell this story. Go somewhere where you can tell this story. And then finally, we get into this coda, and the coda goes on, and I apologize because I'm looking and seeing that, the, that it's not moving as fast. There we go. God defends the righteous is the moral of the story. The wicked are silenced. And then the last word in the psalm is, let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Thanksgiving always points us back to God's unfailing generosity. If you, if you don't understand, once you, and you know, I used to have a, 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 one of my spiritual mothers would always say, just learn to tell God, thank you. Just learn to tell God, thank you. And I would just, I was smart, you know, I was this adolescent. It's like, tell God, thank you, really? Have you seen my face? It's breaking out. Tell God, thank you, really? Tell, 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 tell God, thank you. I'm in high school and I'm having all kinds of emotional problems. I'm going through my adolescence and crying in the middle of the dead night because I don't know what's right. Or, tell God, really, tell God, thank you. But this idea of if we create and know that there is an arc to our story, it starts in lament and starts with our own struggles. And then if our usness meets God's godness, something remarkable happens. There is a story and there is a reason for us to be thankful. Now, what's interesting is that Thanksgiving gets us to a sweet spot because some of us don't like lament because it's just a little too close. Thank you. I got to talk. I want to talk about it. You ever know folks that it's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? I can tell something's wrong. Oh, I, I just don't want to talk about it because it's just too close. 
just to go, I can't do the lament thing. It's just too much. I, I can't. So I don't want to, you know, I just, I just won't complain. There are even gospel songs, which I really don't like, called I Won't Complain. It's like, no, you need to complain. You need to complain because that's what gets you in this, it gets you on this road. You know, I get nervous around folks who never complain. It's like something, I don't know, something's wrong here. But then there are others of us who don't, aren't, we can, we can lament all day. We just can't get to praise and talking about God's godness because that's too far. Are you following the difference? I can, I, God is just too up there. I don't know, what am I gonna say about God? How can I praise God? That's just God. God's God, God doesn't need my praise. What happens is that Thanksgiving by bringing the us story and the God story together becomes doable because it is, I can talk about, if I don't want to talk about my usness, I can talk about how God brought me out of my usness. If I don't want to talk about God, I can talk about myself and how I have grown because of who God is and what God has done. So Thanksgiving in many ways becomes a wonderful prayer model that mitigates some of the resistance that some of us may have been feeling either toward lament or praise. When you bring them together, they kind of balance one another out in a very doable fashion. Have any of you guys struggled a little bit with either lament or praise, thinking about them as prayers? And, and I know that Tim's pushing lament and praise, and I don't know. Uh, I, maybe I yeah, had that kind of sensation. I'm okay with lament, but I'm not too good with praise. Or I really love, I know some folks that would praise you all, just praise God all day long. And then you say what's wrong, and they just don't want to talk about it, right? So if you're struggling in either of those, get yourself into a spirit of thanksgiving. And that's also when you begin to pray prayers and of thanksgiving, where you begin to form your story in your prayer life, your story shapes the witness or your testimony. It shapes the way you carry yourself, the way you speak of your own story, the way that you work. Amen? Partly. Now, this, I, I think over 4 million people have seen this video. And so I'm going to assume that I want to make sure that um, that this is right. Uh, advanced sharing options. I want to make sure that the audio is on. Uh, hopefully the audio is on. But the what? Um, what am I going to do? Hold on one second. Boom! 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 Okay, computer audio is on. Okay, good. I'm going to try to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm in a technical snafu right about now. But if you've seen this video, you'll want to see it again. And if you haven't, you'll want to see it. Over 4 million people have looked at it. And it speaks to the moment we're in right now. And the beauty of this video is it sort of projects a testimony of how we will come through where we are now and what our story will be. So I'm going to hopefully it will play and all will be well. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Let me know if you're not hearing it, raise your hand, okay? Tell me the one about the virus again. Then I'll go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favorite. I promise just once more. Okay, snuggle down, my boy, though I know you know full well. The story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's twenty twenty. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, now it got so quick. It had Thing you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew square and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker so you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. 
We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out, already wrapped. While we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies. More convenient to die. In 2020, the virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. While we all were hidden amidst the fear, all the while, people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their mums. With the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe. And the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the sea. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but so good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct, and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now giving its due. Why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down, dream of tomorrow, and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realization. And yes, since then there have been many. But that's the story of how it started, and why hindsight's 2020. If you look at the camera. I love that. I love that. Why hindsight is 2020. They oh, know stop that. There you go. Let's go on to our next thing. Uh, so uh, I got to figure out how to do this now. The idea of coming out of this with a story is so compelling. But it also is a very, very powerful lesson for us to think that we come out of everything with a story. We do. We come out with a story. And if we are mindful of that as our stories are taking shape, that makes that can make all the difference in the world. I've got to figure out how to do this, how to get us out of this now. <sighs> we don't want to see all this. <laughs> Give me a minute. Stop screen share. Yes. I mean, that's exactly what you have to do. Yes, let me stop share for one second. Tab. There we go. Oh, there you are. Here I am. I'm going to get out of that here in one second. If let me get my the camera. They know oh, someone's filming stop. it because they can see you. Okay. <laughs> in the club. <sighs> Technology. So now, give me one second to move on. It won't, it keeps telling me that I'm, it's probably on sound for some reason. Watch later. I don't know. Okay. Tim, just, while you're doing that, can I tell? Yes, go ahead. Um, maybe some of you saw a, a woman on uh, the news hour last week, I believe, and she was saying when she, would get uh, upset or worried about what was going on, she would tell herself the story of the pandemic and what, as, uh, as if we had already lived through it. And she, she had a positive spin to how we kicked the pandemic and we, we made our lives better also. And so I thought that was a good strategy. Yeah. I think that there is, um, there's a lot that we can be learning and practicing here. And it's just interesting. It's like, I, I'm going to be very blunt with you. I did not, when I started and I said, well, we're going to look at the Psalms. I didn't really think about how all these connections would start to fall into place. But hopefully as we're working together and studying and learning together, we are, um, we're figuring it out. And we're getting ourselves into a better situation of learning that when we run out, it's not the end of us. 
And when we lose control of a situation, that does not mean the situation is out of control. And that's what's, what's really important for us to figure those things out. Because as long as we're trying to, uh, to grasp what's going on with, uh, you know, what's going on in the world and trying to control it to the nth degree, we will create a lot of needless lament because we will never ever fully have everything. Have you ever figured, have you ever experienced that? There's a, you know, just when you think you've got it all together, all of a sudden something comes along that you didn't see coming. And it's like, all right, there it is. It's like, oh, Dorothy Parker used to have a great phrase that I love. She used to say, what fresh hell is this? You know, and because it just, I think I just about got it straight. And now I don't, I don't have it together. I'm giving up on the slides, y'all, which is just about fine. Um, we are, we are at the end. We were at the end of this. Next week, we're going to look at the royal psalms, which are about kings and monarchs. And there's a whole political subtext to those. We're going to spend some time looking at that. It's very fascinating. Um, it will be very timely, and we're looking forward to that. I also can't put up the give sign, but you all know to give. You've done a beautiful job. I want to thank you all. It's been wonderful, all the support that you've all uh, passed our way, and uh, it's going to enable us to do this virtual service and do it in a, in a really clean and wonderful way, so I'm grateful for that. And uh, we're three minutes out. I'm going to open the floor up quickly, and then Tony's going to take us out. He has a Thanksgiving prayer to, to take us out tonight. So before we go, are there any thoughts or any comments that anybody would like to add to tonight's study? Wilbert? So, uh, Tim, I really appreciate everything that you've uh, shared. Uh, I, I know that I've so often experienced that uh, uh, crying and, and hearing God and, and then finally at that position of, of uh, thanksgiving. Uh, I, I would have to say that the process is a little different for me. I find that I actually go from lament to thanksgiving and then to praise. And I think part of it is because of the way I, I grew up. Uh, it, my original faith tradition, I guess, uh, was one where we, we always started the service with a little, little praise, but mm -hmm. it wasn't until the members uh, had this time of um, sharing their stories and being thankful for God pulling them out of the miry clay, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, that we were able to then have our, our really uh, powerful, more meaningful praise. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's, I, I, what I'm trying to do is kind of show us what happens when we like the, the, who God is, the praise of God get into our story where we'll have Thanksgiving. But Wilbert, you're exactly right. Once you get that Thanksgiving in place and you see what God has done, then the praise comes, it's even, it, it's magnified, right? I think that's one of the, and we hear that kind of talk over and over again in the Psalms. Magnify the Lord with me, right? Praise God even more. Bless the Lord, all my soul, everything. You know, the, uh, one of the great translations of that text is, bless the Lord, let me, even in my gut, let me praise God, you know? And so that you're right there is a magnificence and a much more intense praise that lays on the other side of the thanksgiving too i believe and so the process you can kind of come they're, they're not, it's not i'm teaching it in a linear way but it's not necessarily linear right they kind of come and go if that makes sense um and yes i i agree with you because we did we were we would start out singing about god you're yeah we would do praise first then we would do testimony then we do thanksgiving then we go back to praise yeah any other thoughts? You all are just beautiful. I'm looking at you over here. I'm sorry, you're getting my profile, but I'm looking at you over here because my camera's dead over there and you're all just lovely. It's wonderful to see you all. <laughs> well, we are, uh, we're right at 8.30. Tony, why don't, you, why don't you give us our final blessing and uh, tell us just a wee bit, just a little bit about the prayer uh, since we're at 8.30 and then, uh, and then pray us out. All right, so this is a prayer from the Mi'kmaq people on the east coast of North America. So from like Maine, Quebec, New Brunswick, probably that region. And it's actually interesting because to those of you a pilgrim, 
you might remember me saying this at our actual Thanksgiving service down in the basement in West November. <laughs> and so I just wanted to say this prayer because this was the reason I was going to pray this say this, la this last thing, but then I decided to move it to the Apache prayer, but this is the prayer that I was originally going to say. All right. So here it is. Creator, open our hearts to peace and healing between all people. Creator, open our hearts to provide and protect for all children of the earth. Creator, open our hearts to respect for the earth and all the gifts of the earth. Creator, open our hearts to end exclusion, violence, and fear among all. Thank you for the gifts of this day and every day. Amen. 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 God bless you all. It's lovely always to see you. Remember, if, you, uh, if you're interested in, in joining the virtual choir for the Pentecost Sunday, uh, Sunday evening service, Please let me know so we can begin moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, uh, you're going to be hearing from me. I'm going to be pestering.